Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this video about the licensed software. Today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about soil depth data and how you can obtain this for usage in the Lysum physically based hazard model. So whether you're making your own model or using the interface model that's already available, it's usually very important to have well, reasonable quality soil depth data. And this is particularly troublesome to get. So that is a very vague concept and it's tricky to get any detailed measurements of it because that's very labor intensive. And especially it's difficult to get spatial coverage of that data. So usually some kind of interpolation or modeling is required. Now, let's look at some solutions that can be used to solve this issue. I have here an elevation model opened in the Lysum as a hill shade, and this elevation data is um, for an, an area in South Korea where there was a dam break at some point. Now we wanted to model hydrology and as part of that uh, also slope failure, and we needed soil depth information. Now, luckily for us, there were a couple of observations. So I have those here uh, in the shape file. And if I go into the, uh, the attribute table, you can see, okay, there are some depth values in meters associated with these points. Well, what I can do next is rasterize these observations. And as an output, what I get then is observation stop map. So if we look at that, we have to set the range ourselves because not always these very sparse values are detected in the map. So the minimum and maximum value are not always correctly set. But if we do that ourselves, looking from zero to five, we see directly that, okay, there's five pixels here that have been set with those particular soil values. But of course, this is not enough. We need to have spatial coverage. Now, one thing we can do is inverse distance interpolation. And this is a common interpolation technique for geospatial data. First to do that, we use the following line, line number eight here, to create a map with just the observations and missing values outside of that. So if I close again the data that I had opened, and I open observation missing value, we see that I just get a set of five points, five pixels with data, and the rest is all missing data. Now to create the missing data, I use the map if function. And the map if function, uh, asks for a conditional map with either zeros or ones indicating false or true. It indicates a result that has to be assigned in case of true. And if you don't provide an, uh, a map with data to be assigned in case of false, it automatically puts all the values where the condition is false as missing value. Now with this, we can finally do our inverse distance interpolation, providing the points, um, uh, providing the data, and then providing also the power that we have to use, we want to use in the inverse distance interpolation. So if I go and open up the inverse distance interpolation results, this is what I get. In reality, this will work fine for something like hydrological modeling, but once you start uh, doing process modeling for slope stability and run out, you start to run into issues. And the main factor there is this. Typically, the soil depth is a product of all the previous instabilities in the landscape. So as soon as soil depth reaches too high of a depth, it starts to become unstable during extreme rainfall events, etc., during earthquakes, and it starts to fill. So on steeper slopes, you typically see that soil cannot increase to large depths, not the same as in valleys. And all the accumulation of those failures and erosion processes typically accumulates in the valleys where you see deeper soils. To run an efficient slope stability model uh, with some accuracy, these spatial patterns, the dependency of soil depth on the slope and on the topography and the, and the geomorphology has to be taken into account. Now there's a couple of ways to do this. Um, well, in Lysen we, we could try this with gridging, but again, we don't have so many points here, so that won't work so well. There was one other alternative um, I'll quickly show you, but you'll see that we have a very similar problem here. So going back here, we see now that we've made our uh, map for the Navier Stokes in painting method as well. And this gives us more of kind of uh, closest area uh, value assigned to it. But again, this doesn't reflect the geomorphology of the area at all. There is one additional thing we can do, uh, and that's where we start to see some more, more intricate methods applied. The ISRIC uh, Institute in the Netherlands actually created a global prediction of soil properties, including soil depth. 
There's also other kinds of physical parameters for the soil. But what we can do is actually look on the website and find their 250 meter global prediction of absolute depth to bedrock. Now, in our case, those 250 meter pixels will only, uh, there will only be a couple pixels in our entire study site. So still, it won't be that much use to us in this case. We need the finer dependencies on the geomorphology to work well. That's where our next options comes in. The next option that I have in line 30 is a steady state soil depth. And this method was originally published by the team behind the step model in a paper by uh, Red et al. in 2013. And by using this method, what we can do is, is physically based predict the soil depth over an area, which includes all the uh, geomorphology and slope relationships. Now, this is the output that you would typically get. And here we see the patterns, the dependencies on the terrain reflected. We have shallower soils on the tops of the slopes and we have a lot of accumulation in the valleys. Now, in line 34 and 35 of the script, you see a more custom implementation where you can provide your own flow accumulation network to determine the, uh, to, as an input for the soil depth algorithm. And that gives kind of different results. One of these is really focused more on larger river systems, while the other one works a bit better for upslope areas. Um, in reality, typically, we have to merge them and make some combination of both. Okay, now you might wonder, okay, this is a prediction. How can I ensure that it's any good? Well, like any model, the best way to do that is to calibrate this model. So let's have a look at how that can be done. I've opened here a, a script that will automatically calibrate the soil depth uh, using the steady state soil function. So how this works is the following. We start in our function main, which is our entry point for the script. Now we have three nested for loops. This means that we're going for each loop to vary our value of the parameter, in this case, i from zero to 10, then j from zero to 10, and then finally k from zero to 10. In total, that means we have a thousand unique combinations and we iterate over all of them. For each of these uh, indices, I'm going to calculate an estimate of the input parameter that I need. Now, each of these input parameters have, has a different meaning. Uh, we have a multiplier for the soil depth, we have a production, which is sort of a, an indication of the weathering rate, and we have a movement coefficient. Now, each of these three, I've given some ranges to vary amongst, and this is based on some manual testing that I did before. Then finally, I'm going to run my soil depth model and get the error that this soil depth model makes. And finally, I'm going to check, is this the best model run that I've done? Which means, did it have a lower error than anything I've seen before? If so, print the error and give me the parameter values that have been the best ones so far. Now within the soil depth error function, you see that it's defined above and it takes these three parameters and returns the error that the model makes. So we run our soil model, we compare with the observation map and calculate the map total of the square differences, which is the root mean square error. Now we don't have actually have to take the square root here, we're just interested in finding a minimum. So finding a minimum of the quadratic of that same function identical for our purposes. Um, but the whole idea holds. We return our error. The higher the error is, the less favorable that model run is to us. Okay, so let us try to run this script. So when I run the script, we see that the model starts iterating over these different parameter values. And each time it does so, it gives us a message if our estimate was the best estimate that we've seen so far. So finally, uh, this on my laptop will take a couple hours to run for a thousand different realizations of the soil depth and finally give me the best soil depth prediction that the model could make. I hope this video was useful for you and give you some kind of guidelines for using soil depth in your physically based modeling. If you have any further questions, please see the links in the description below and feel free to contact me as well. Thank you.